you know, listen, the Road Warriors, no matter what, they're the greatest tag team of all time. They always will be, um, Animal and Hawk. Um, yeah, but I mean, we were similar to them, but we were just a bigger version of them that came in, into the business and that stuff. And uh, you know what? They gave us our blessing, man. They loved it because they had absolutely nobody at that time. <laughs> they were being on everybody so bad. And we came in, we were bigger, we were badder, and it, it made for great matches between us. What was the relationship with them like? Well, you know, to tell you the truth, Animal's the one that got me started into wrestling. He found me in Minnesota at his gym and kept bugging me to get into professional wrestling. I, I finally started it, and uh, it just happened to work out really well. And where did the warlord, like where did the, that character and that name kind of come from? It was again with Animal again. <laughs> before we even before I even got in the business, um, when I, we were at the gym, we started, we needed a name. So we started kicking our name, and their road warrior said, well, you need some, something similar to us. And we just came out with uh, Warlord. You say, you know, you guys are the bigger version of those guys. Was that something that would bother them at all, or is that something that they totally embraced? Like, okay, these are two guys that are just massive, massive guys. No, they loved it. They embraced it because, you know, nobody had ever put them down, and we were the tag team that was plenty big enough to put to put them down. Oh, yeah. Now, with you and Barbarian, when you guys got together and became a team and really became the powers of Paul Jones and, and, and the NWA and, and Jim Crockett promotions, how did you guys kind of get put together? Um, you know, when I, I when I came back, I was actually in Kansas City, and I came back to the NWA, and I was doing singles. And I started getting closer to Barbarian all the time. We started to become pretty good friends, and then uh, we just started saying, you know what? The two of us, we go together so well. We just and, and the way our styles were, we were, we were similar in many ways. We just said that'd be just an awesome tag team to start getting together, and we just need a couple of the names. And the name came about that I actually did a – we had a match with the Road Warriors, and uh, at that time we were just Barbarian and Warlord, and I did a move with Animal, and something happened. We landed wrong. And my shoulder blade went into his eye and pushed his eye socket all the way back in. Oh. So, yeah, he had to get surgery, everything else. And out of that, <laughs> it came from him. He said, you guys would be called the powers of pain because that's exactly hmm. what you are, the powers of pain. So fitting and, and so perfect. It's just, uh, just absolutely great. As far as chemistry with those guys, with the Road Warriors, do you guys think you guys mesh well? Obviously, you know, you guys lift the weights and kind of did that whole feud with the bench press and things like that. But what about in-ring? you guys think you mesh well with the roadies? I think it was great. I think we had great matches. Listen, for, for a team to have good matches with them, you, you either got to be a, you gotta be either a small tag team where they're just going to fly for those guys, or you got to be a massive team where you can do all the big power moves, you can match up and all the big power moves, but yet you guys are in such great shape, you guys can move around that ring so fast too and that stuff and do it all at once. And that's what people was impressed because not only could you, you know, you could do everything in the ring at once. Love that. Just just the, the view of you guys. I mean, four massive, larger-than-life guys. I mean, you don't see guys like you too much anymore in wrestling. I mean, this, these are just scary, scary dudes. Yeah, there's there's nothing like that in wrestling no more. And even the tag teams now, they just throw them together. They don't make sense anymore. I mean, you know, our era was about it. Really was about tag teams. Look at the incredible tag teams you had. You had the Legion of Doom that came in. You had the British Bulldogs. You had the uh, uh, Bushwhackers. You had the Heart Foundation. I mean, you had so many unique, incredible tag teams, and they went together great. Do you think that that's kind of the golden era, the golden age of kind of tag team wrestling? It can't really get better than that. No, never touch it. Nothing will touch it. Nothing will touch that, that era anyway. No matter whatever comes, it's never going to touch that era. We were everybody at that time was 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 larger. Like we were actually true cartoon characters in real life. That's what we were. So so true. What is it about that era? I mean, it is so. It's like obviously to me anyway, and to a lot of people, the best era for wrestling. But what is it about kind of that golden era, that golden age, that really nothing has been able to touch it as far as just the guys just being so revered and so loved and so just uh, you know looked after so fondly. What is it about that era? It was special. The guys, the guys were very very close. It's kind of like if you watch. I don't know if you ever watch a movie, Pumping Iron. 
mm-hmm. back in oh, that yeah. time with bodybuilding. That was the most incredible era of bodybuilding. I mean, with Arnold, Lou Ferrigno, all those guys. They were so tight, so close-knit. They looked after one another, you know, and, and they made each other better. That's what my era was. I mean, how can you get better than Hulk Hogan, Andre the Giant, Brett the Hitman Hart, Randy Savage, Ultra Warrior, the tag teams? I mean, how can you get better than that? And the chemistry just went together. And also back then, you got to remember, we all came from different territories. We learned the different territories. So we learned all different styles of wrestling, not just one style like today. We learned all different styles. So we finally made it to the WWF. We could work with all these different styles and make incredible matches. So true and such a great era. And I feel like there is no kind of, obviously the territories are dead, but there's no work for these guys to really learn and hone their craft anymore, right? I mean, it just seems like they're just kind of thrown out there, but they really shouldn't be. No, everything, you know, if you go to WWE now, everybody comes out of the, the developmental school up in Orlando now. I mean, you're taught by the same person. You're taught to talk by the same person. You're taught to work by the same person. You're taught by the same people. You don't have all these different people, you know, giving you different advice and different ways to look at different things and different styles and everything. Everything comes out the same now. So when you go in, you're doing the same thing as everybody else, and everybody's trying to do the bigger move than the next one now. I mean, how much bigger moves can you do now without somebody dying out there? Right. It's crazy. It's like, can you top this? And it's kind of getting I mean, how to many, be scary. Yeah, how, many, how many times can you do a DDT in a match and a guy gets back up? I mean, Jake the State gave one DDT. You're done. I guess our Wheaties were more incredible than their Wheaties are today. <laughs> Yeah, it is definitely def- a great point. I mean, it is – they basically just throw the kitchen sink at the guy and he kicks out nowadays. It's crazy. Now, you mentioned, obviously, the golden era. You mentioned a lot of those great guys in the WBF, and we were talking about Vince McMahon just a, just a tad, and but, but also, obviously, Hogan, the warrior savage of that era. When you got to WBF, was that something where they kind of recruited you in, like Vince was – looking after you guys? Obviously, you fit in like a glove, but were you recruited in? Actually, um, what happened is Barb and me were with uh, NWA at the time, and uh, uh, Grizzly, who was uh, Jake's, Jake the Snake's dad, uh, gave us a call, called Barbarian up at his house one night, got a hold of his number, and it was a Thursday night, and they said, he told him, hey, guys, I'd like you guys, if you can, you're off tomorrow, we'd like to fly up to uh, – Atlanta, we were living in Charlotte at the time. We want to fly into Atlanta. We'd like to talk to you. So Barb gives me a call and says, Terry, you know, we're flying to uh, Atlanta tomorrow. I said, okay. So we go and we fly into Atlanta, limo way in there. Limo picked us up to this beautiful hotel. Go up to this room, open the door. Inside the room sent Pat Patterson, Hulk Hogan, and Vince McMahon, all three of them. So we sit down. They go through their spiel. And, uh, and, I look around, and my partner, who didn't talk a whole lot at the time, he looked at me, he goes, when do you want us to start? I'm like, I look at Barb, I said, Barb, what? And they said, we want you to start Monday, and this is a Friday. So I look at him, I said, Monday? And Barb says, we be there. I'm like, okay, man, <laughs> you know, whatever you want to do, Barb. And um, we started that Monday. We started that Monday with, with, uh, with the WWF at that time. They must have really wanted you guys. I mean, that's a pretty quick turnaround. Boom, starting three days later. Well, it was nice, you know, because, I mean, you know, we were one of the first ones out of the, to get taken from the NWA into the W. Everybody followed us, you know, after that, Arn Anderson, Tully, Rick, you know, uh, Road Wars. Everybody came in after us, you know. But, you know, I mean, it just it, – it was a good thing at the time. Listen, we were going to be doing those scaffold matches with the Road Wars, and they weren't going to fall off that scaffold. <laughs> we were and sooner or later, it, was, it would have been no given time. We would have been got hurt. You know, 20, 25 feet in the air, you're going to get hurt sometime. God, no doubt about it. And given how big you guys are, too, I mean, it's just something bound to happen that's not yeah, so good. Something, something's going to give sometime. I think so many people remember you when you got into WWF. It's not like when they did the thing with Tito bringing you in. They don't really remember Baron Von Raschke. I feel like they really, really remember Survivor Series 88, which is such a great show, and that is such a great tag team match you guys have. And that double turn where you guys turn heel and you end up with Mr. Fuji, demolition turns face. Is that something that 
really kind of sticks in your mind because it sticks in so many fans. By I mean, that was one of the the greatest, if not the best, like double turn of all time. Yeah, it was it was it was good. The only problem is when it when it happened, everybody thought we were staying babyface, and and Fuji was turning baby, and Demolition was going to stay heel. So when we started doing matches after that. Everybody was loving us, and I'm looking. I said, Barb, they're not supposed to love us, you know. And we actually had to do extra special things every single night to get the people to hate us because everybody was everybody was loving us so much with coming out with Fuji. And we really had to work hard to try turning heel. Did you think maybe you should have stayed facing? Because obviously you're still over then if, you know, if, if they kind of rooting for you. I would have loved to stay in baby. I, mean, I, just, I love being baby face at that time. It was, it was, it was good. And, and Barb and me were getting over really good. And, uh, you know, but, you know, it, it's business. I understand business. What was their thought process? They won't really want a demolition to be the baby face? Demolition wanted to be babyface. Oh, and he was just kind of going with their wishes and kind of what was best for business at that point? Yeah, yeah. What about Royal Rumble 89? You only last about three seconds. It's one of those things where, like, you're in and out. Hogan uh, eliminates you immediately. But for so many years, they would constantly show you on TV, and you'd be the answer to trivia. Was that something you looked down upon, or was that something you're like, oh, okay, that's pretty cool because they mentioned me all the time? Was it really three seconds? I think it was about a second. <laughs> <laughs> um, listen, before I did that that day, that backflip, I had to go to the ring that afternoon. I was wearing, because I only had jeans at that time. I split my jeans in half. I had to go over that rope about 20 times backwards that day to get it down. So I had split jeans. I had to go. I had the next day. I had to go try and find some new jeans I could wear when I'm on the road. Cause I had no, <laughs> I had none. I had no jeans. I had to wear some sweatpants, you know. Um, but um, listen, I it, it for me to get knocked out by Hulk Hogan that didn't bother me. The biggest man ever in wrestling name didn't bother me a bit. And the it way is. and the way it was done and the way it was done when I get up on there, I turn around to the people, I pose, I walk through, and boom, he comes right running across 100 miles an hour and hits me. It was beautiful. And it's one of those things where it's like if they always bring you up and you're kind of a trivia answer or were, were a trivia answer for a long time, it's one of those things where it's actually kind of cool and works in your favor because then everybody's still talking about the warlord. Yep. No, it was um, – to me, man, it, it didn't bother me a bit. Like I say, to get knocked out by Hulk Hogan, that don't bother me a bit. Were you ever destined to feud with Hogan? I know I, I, there's been rumors. I know you faced him in 91 during your singles run, but was there ever destined to be a big feud between you two? Because that seems like it would kind of make a lot of sense. Yeah, um, it's about it. I, I, I really don't know. They, you know. They were going so many different directions at that time. Um, listen, I would have loved it because the matches we did, places were, were sold out. I mean, I only did a couple interviews for Hogan and, and the building, I mean, you go to Long Island in the middle of the summer, there's usually nobody there because everybody goes to the beach. And on a Friday night, we were packed. Um, other places we went to, Barb and me worked against Big Boss Man and Hogan together. Uh, Spectrum jam-packed on a Sunday afternoon. I mean, you know, we, we, you know, I did great with Hogan. We did great with, with Hogan and a partner and that stuff, you know. It just, you know, like I say, it's business and you know, I was a kid at the time. A lot of business I really didn't understand at that time yet. Now I understand things, but at that time I didn't yet. What did you think about that gimmick? Because it's such a cool look. I mean, the shaved head, the silver metallic, almost Phantom of the Opera, cyborg, robot type, uh, half mask, the black armor, the staff. I mean, it was really, really cool. And then you had the big W on the staff. I mean, I thought it was just an awesome, awesome look. What, what were your thoughts on that gimmick? I love the gimmick. I thought it was great. Very futuristic, um, very cyborgish at that time, which really wasn't, you know, no one had at that time. Um, the first mask they came out, I really didn't like that much because it was kind of oddly shaped and, and didn't really fit right. And then one day he said, you know what, we have somebody for you that we'd like to send you there, and, but it's going to take a while to do that mask because it actually was, they put plaster of Paris on my face and I had to breathe through a straw for a bunch of hours till it hardened on my face, and they took it off, and that's how they got to form right. That was actually my face. That was that mask. Wow, they, a lot more went into it than you even realized. You know, I, I yeah. never knew that. It's pretty cool. Yeah, a lot went into it. Did you have any say on what it was going to look like? Um, no, just they said, you know what? We just 
they just they showed me some pictures what they were thinking about, and they asked if I liked them. And I, I saw the first picture. I said, yeah, I love it. I just didn't like the mask at that time. And then we uh, we got the mask fixed up, and I thought it was great. And I know figure wise, when you collect figures and stuff, especially as a kid, I mean that was such a cool one to get because it, it looked so cool. And obviously, you're a big guy, so I mean it's just a cool look in general and, and very different. Oh yeah, I got I got a bunch of the action figures. I got them saved for my kids and all my grandkids. They are going up in value, so I mean that's a good thing to hold on to. It's very very cool. Those Hasbro figures and even LJNs. Your LJN is definitely worth a good amount of money. Yeah, that well. LJN's worth a lot, and that little Hasbro now. Mm-hmm. I just saw they had one on Amazon for me, and man, it was going for a lot of money. I said, "Wow, you know, I got a whole bunch of those put away, all for my kids and grandkids." Awesome. And what do you think about Slick, uh, the pairing with Slick? Good combination? Yeah, I, I like Slick. Slick was a very very smart guy, man. Yeah, I tell you what, though, he could talk. I mean, you could definitely tell he's a preacher. He can talk. Hmm. Good chemistry as well? Yeah. Got along great with Slick. I, but I didn't have problems with any man. I got along with all the managers, everything else. And I would just listen to them and that stuff, you know, and, and uh, you know, just go with them and that stuff. Go along with what they're doing. Now, as we hit the wind down and head towards the finish, I just want to ask about maybe some favorite matches you had. A lot of people, obviously, like you said before, bring up British Bulldog, maybe WrestleMania 7, that match and, and that feud. What are some of the favorite matches that you've had in your career? Um, in the career, you know, I mean, you know, it was it was such an honor to, to work with the Road Warriors, of course, in the NWA. I mean, I mean, it was it was incredible. I mean, you know, you're working with the greatest tag team of all the time and you're having incredible matches. And the two tag teams just went together so well. That was so much fun. And then, um, you know, of course, when I got to the uh, WWF, um, it, it was, I tell you, some of the best matches we ever had was with the uh, Rockers, Marty Jannetty and Shawn Michaels, because they knew how to work with big men. And we just, our matches, I mean, even Hogan would say on the card, I don't want to follow you guys, because we just, we tear the house down with the things we could do. Um and then, of course, working with Demolition, which was an honor. You know, them being tag team champions and that stuff, you know. And, and uh, you know, they had a great name in wrestling at the time. Um, working with uh, Brett the Hitman Hart, that was an honor because he was such an incredible wrestler at that time. And him and me had great chemistry together. And then, of course, we were working with, with British Bulldog, Davey Boy Smith. I mean, you know, 285 pounds, I'm 330. And, you know, we just had some incredible matches together. Now, you're mentioning Bulldog and Demolition, and they, those guys always get mentioned for the WWE Hall of Fame pretty much every year. Uh, Demolition may be not in because of politics. Bulldog, I'm not even sure why he wouldn't have been in years ago, which is just crazy to think about it. Do you ever think about the WWE Hall of Fame? Oh, of course. I'd love to be in, in the Hall of Fame like, like those guys. And listen, we all deserve it. We all deserve it. Demolition definitely deserves it. The British Bulldog deserved it a long time ago. I, it's it just sad, you know. I, you know, it, 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 like I say, he should have been there a long time ago. And you know, Barb and me, you know, coming in the way we did and that stuff, you know. I mean, you know, we're we, we're definitely deserving of having the Hall of Fame too. I've seen some guys there. It's just like wow, you know. And and you got these guys that are just they were incredible. They did so much for the sport at that time to make it what it is today. Do you ever talk to barbarians and say, like, you know, how come we're not in or we should be in or, or stuff like that? Or is that, like, not really part of the uh, the conversation? No, I just saw Demolition a couple weeks ago. We did a signing. You know, I look at them. I said, man, you guys should be in the – they said, yeah, uh, that, that'll that probably never happen. I mean, just like you say, politics. Politics. It's all politics. Is it just – I mean, they always say it's just what Vince McMahon wants. Is that true? Like, it's just what Vince wants, that's who's in the Hall of Fame? Do you know anything about, like, I pretty further much about think that? That's it. No, I think that's pretty much it. That's just the way it is. Listen, the WWF is Vince. No matter who is running it right now, it's still Vince. I don't care what anybody says. His hand is there, and it's awful powerful yet. It is funny to think, like, who's in the Hall of Fame and who's not in the Hall of Fame. And you're just, like, think of that era of those guys. It's like – Every guy from that era pretty much should be in the Hall of Fame, right? I mean, like, that is the era that kind of set it off. That's the era that did everything for the sport. It did so much for that sport. Such a, a great time to be a fan. I mean, definitely the, the best era 
And, hey, a guy like you has spawned a lot of other guys that are interested and in just really – Dave Batista always says you're a fair wrestler. Is that something where you, you're very proud that to you and, and kind of you were, you were a big part of why they got into the business? Listen, coming from Batista, that's an honor because here's a guy that got into it that's a big, big man like himself and not only became a champion there, but also now look what he does in uh, movies. I mean, he's an international superstar. I mean, to me, that's an honor when somebody says, I started wrestling because of you. That's an honor for me. Do you ever get surprised when you hear people say, oh, I looked up to you or, or I'm, I was a big fan of you, and when it is a guy like Batista? Like I say, it's, it's an honor, man. It makes me feel great inside because, you know, I, I got to touch somebody that liked it so much that they want to start and do that thing because of seeing you and what you did. Very, very cool. And now as far as you and wrestling and just thinking back to the singles run, the tag run, obviously NWA, WWF, what do you, like when you look back and, and let's say the career is over and, and everything is, is done and you look back, what's the legacy of Warlord on wrestling? Um, mostly that, you know, I, I just touched that, you know, I was able to touch the people out there, um, that they got to enjoy what I did. <clears throat> they got to enjoy the matches. And, you know, now that I go around doing the independent, they get to enjoy me as the person personally where they can actually talk to me and we can have a nice conversation, which is really nice to have now. And now when I do it, now it's just doing it for the people, giving something back to the people now. One thing I've kind of been dying to ask you, and it's so interesting, because some guys with wrestling years later, you know, obviously if your prime is in the 80s and 90s, stuff, years later, you, they won't look the same or maybe they won't look as good. How, like what's the secret for you? Because you look exactly the same as big and as scary as you ever were, like these people that are going to see you in New Jersey, they're going to be shocked. Like, wow, Warlord is still the Warlord. Like, what's been your secret after all these years to kind of maintain that? Just uh, basically for me, it's just taking care of yourself, staying away from all the evil things out there. Take care of your body. Your body, if you take care of your body, your body will take care of you. I mean, what I do for a living now, I do private security and bodyguard work. you got to take care of yourself. And... uh you know, it, it, it's also helped in professional wrestling. It's also taking care of the body that way. Then you go out. I mean, listen, I'm 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 a, probably a step slower when I was when I was young. I mean, I'm getting ready to turn 59 years old coming up. Mm-hmm. So you're not, you know, and you, some things you just can't do anymore out there. It's just it's just nature. But I still could do a bunch of things yet, and I'm still in very good shape, and I can still you know put a nice performance on for the people and that stuff. It is amazing, like, that you and Barbarian, too. I mean, you guys are still just, you know, big guys and stay in great shape. It's kind of a testament to you guys that, that after all these years, because not to say anything bad about another wrestler, but sometimes they don't look the same, and you're like, is that who it is? You guys, it's like, holy shit, there's the power of pain. There, there's, you know, uh, Warlord and Barbarian. Or, you know, there's Warlord. He's still huge. It's, it's definitely a compliment for you guys. These guys are still stay in great, great shape. Yeah, it, uh, it makes you feel good. And that's when people come up and say, yeah, I mean, you guys could still go out there and WWE and that stuff. And I said, well, <laughs> <laughs> maybe not quite anymore, but uh, yeah, we can, we can still, we still go out and put a very good show on. And of course, 229 Titan Championship Wrestling. You can find them on Facebook. Just type in, type in Titan Championship Wrestling. It's going to be a huge show. Passaic Valley, Elks Lodge, Totowa, New Jersey. You will be, of course, with Eric Sims, ESSpromotions.com versus Steve Mossimak. It is Winter's Revenge. It's going to be a huge, huge show. Winter's Revenge, 229, Totowa, New Jersey, for Titan Championship Wrestling. Warlord, please, just where can the fans kind of reach out to you? Do you have social media, things like that? Guys, I'm, I'm like a hermit almost. I stay away from all social media, everything. Um, like I say, the people that come up, that night, you know, I'll be out there. Come talk to me. Come say hi, everything. I'll talk to you. You have a little conversation, whatever, and that stuff. Like I say, I like talking to the fans. I like hearing from them and that stuff. It's always nice. And for those fans and attendants, don't be intimidated of uh, the Warlord. He is a big dude, and he still kind of looks the same. But don't be scared. Definitely get up, get an autograph, get a picture. You, you won't regret it. Titan Championship Wrestling, Winter's Revenge, the Warlord, ESS Promotions, going to be great. Warlord, thank you so much for all the time tonight. Really appreciate it. And looking forward to 229 for TCW. 
Cool. Thank you very much, man. Looking forward to everybody.